SEP Fanfic Readings presents Deep, Deeply by Anonymous Part 3 The little sleep he'd managed hadn't quelled his racing thoughts. Hermione Granger had kissed him. Instead of horrified, he reflected on the warmth of her lips on his. He remembered how strong the floral scent was when her hair brushed against his cheek, her beautiful but panicked expression as she pulled away from him. He'd kissed her back, he realized, sometime around 4 a.m. Draco had wanted her lips on his for longer than he was prepared to admit, and even more desperately as of late. He thought that part of him was lost in Azkaban, but one kiss from Hermione Granger and it had all come roaring back to life. Hermione had placed herself in his world. His plans to ignore her and push her away had failed. He'd allowed her to take up residence beside him. He could have fought harder. He could have acted crueler but something within him made him stop. And maybe that something wasn't in him after all. Maybe it was Hermione herself. A full minute passed after Draco knocked on her door. It was enough time to debate running. He could pretend he was never there. He could hide in his dorm. But even as he considered it, he realized Hermione would see him on that bloody map of hers. He took a hesitant step back while waiting for Hermione to open the door. She was there in her loungewear, hiding a yawn behind an open hand. Her hair was must, and that was the kindest description Draco could think of to give. Her curls were matted and chaotic. As she slept, they'd taken on a life of their own. She looked up at him, with sheet-stained cheeks and cloudy eyes. Draco? He entered the room without invitation. The first thing he noticed was how bright it was. The morning sun filtered in throughout her eastern-facing window. It reflected off her mirror, casting the entire room in an orange glow. By the time he'd mustered enough courage to face her again, Hermione had shut the door. She observed him patiently with her hands lax at her sides. "'We have eight more weeks,' he started. "'There's no house rivalry, no war. I think we should try our hand at dating.' Her tired eyes blinked. "'There's an end date,' he tilted his head. I meant it as more as, we have an opportunity here, and I'm willing to give it a go if you are. She rubbed her face and sat on the edge of the bed. The morning sun created a halo of light around her small frame. It drew Draco a step closer. On two conditions, she said. The first, I'll need to know every limitation placed on you by the Ministry. I won't be blindsided again. Hermione glared, but the slight twitch at the corner of her lips said she wasn't all that upset about it. And the second, you'll go with me to the gala, as my date. That idea made him nervous. Of course, if they were to date, that would be expected of him. The old Draco would have paraded the prettiest witch around on his arm. But this was different. He was different. He wasn't that Draco, nor did the public receive him that way. He'd ruin this for her. He'd... Draco, came her softer voice. He looked down to find her watching him. She was smiling now. Her brown eyes bore into his with a level of affection he wasn't used to. It made him shiver. "'It's a big ask,' she added. "'I'll amend my condition and say, "'I'd like you to consider going with me.' His brows touched as he frowned. It felt like being thrown a bone he didn't deserve. "'I'll go with you,' he forced out behind grit teeth. She didn't appear convinced. Hermione's smile faded. Her back straightened and she reeled in a deep breath. But Draco didn't let her dwell. He was suddenly standing between her legs, holding her face between his hands. I said I'll go. His tone was harsh. It lacked the gentleness in which he used to hold her. Hermione's lips were parted as her head was drawn back. Her eyes had widened, but she didn't look scared. She looked hopeful. Draco leaned down and took her lips between his own. She released a muffled sigh, and he was done for. His hand slid into her hair. He deepened the kiss. Arching down further, he directed Hermione onto her back. Her legs dangled off the bed as he straddled her thighs. He was happy and warm, and... Draco released her lips with a pop. He pressed his forehead into hers. Why me? She pulled a hand around his waist and up his spine. For all the parts of you I know, and all the ones I haven't yet learned. But if you need reassurance, kiss me again. His lips pulled into a lazy smile, but Draco did as she asked. He leaned into her, his hand curling tighter around her neck. She responded in kind. 
Hermione's hips lifted into his, and she placed a firm hand low on his back. His nose knocked into hers, but she didn't appear to notice. Her actions were as eager and desperate as his. I never meant to pressure you into this, but I'm happy I did. Her words were a whisper against his lips. I'm glad you did too, Hermione. It wasn't as simple as kissing Hermione Granger, and then having all of his problems solved. In fact, kissing Hermione Granger seemed to have the opposite effect. Nothing outwardly changed between them those first few days, sans a few impromptu snog sessions. They shared their meals in silence. They studied side by side in the library. It was the lack of progress, of change, that had Draco anxious. They should talk more, flirt more. Others should be able to recognize that he'd staked his claim on the brightest witch of their age. But instead, everything felt stagnant. In an effort to change that, when Draco sat next to her in the library that evening, he stroked Hermione's knee with his thumb. She flinched before flashing him an apologetic look. She brought her own hand down beneath the desk and covered his fingers to keep him there. "'We're still on for tomorrow night?' he asked. Her face contorted briefly, brows pulling higher, eyes squinting in thought. Then started the smile that slowly caressed her cheeks. "'Where are we going?' He shook his head. "'I've made arrangements, if that's all right.' Her shoulders shrugged, and she nodded idly. "'Whatever you have planned is fine.' Draco surprised even himself when he leaned in and pressed his lips to her temple. By the tell of the blush that descended her neck, she too was surprised, but it wasn't unwelcomed. Hermione squeezed his hand a little tighter before turning back down to her notes. "'Is the blindfold really necessary?' she asked. The hint of irritation in her voice didn't go unnoticed, but Draco kept his amusement to himself. He relished in the warmth of her shoulders as he held them beneath his hands. Draco guided her forward, ignoring the urges to caress her even further. "'Given the Ministry would be knocking down my door the very minute I tried to apparate, I've had to resort to non-magical forms of secret-keeping.' She mumbled something inaudible, and Draco chuckled. "'A minute more, that's all I ask,' he said. Hermione leaned back into his hands, and that was all the reassurance he needed. He led her down a set of rickety steps. He took an arm around her waist and lifted her off the platform. "'I hear water,' she noted as her legs wobbled. "'We're on a boat.' "'Oh, the boathouse!' With a growl, Draco freed her from the blindfold. "'Next time could you pretend to be surprised, or at the very least keep your observations to yourself?' "'Yes,' she smirked. "'Because that would be a completely normal thing for me to do.' He rolled his eyes. Taking her hand, he brought her down onto the bench. He'd retrofitted it with plush fabric just for the occasion. The ever-burning tea lights and blankets, too. Draco sat across from her. He removed his wand from his sleeve, and with a quick spell he charmed the oars. The boat began to move, pulling away from the boathouse and out onto the black lake. The sky above was as clear as it had been the night of their swim. Draco admired all the stars, feeling the constellations were all there in support of them. Another spell, and he'd conjured two glasses of wine. They bobbed and floated between them as he dragged out a large crate from beneath his feet. Draco could feel Hermione's eyes on the top of his while he transfigured the box into a table and laid out their spread. "'You put a lot of thought into this,' she whispered, breaking the melodic peace created by the oars combing through the dark waters. "'We've spent our entire lives in the public eye. I want to know who Hermione Granger is away from the scrutiny of others.' "'That's strangely romantic,' she grinned. "'I can be, given I'm with the deserving witch.' He watched as Hermione admired the tapas, charcuterie, eggplant caponata, shishito peppers, and chorizo with figs. "'I can't cook,' he admitted, not meeting her stares while he said it. "'But I paid the castle elves handsomely to get this done for you.' Hermione laughed. She took one of the peppers between her fingers and took a bite. "'My compliments to the chefs.' They ate in compatible silence. The only hint of awkwardness existed because Draco couldn't keep his eyes off of her. Hermione, with her wild hair and bare, sun-kissed shoulders. She was a vision, and one he wholeheartedly believed was too good for him. He sipped his wine. "'May I ask you something?' Hermione leaned back on her hands and nodded. "'Why'd you sit with me on our first day? Why go through any of this?' Her lips followed her eyes as they diverted toward the water. 
I wasn't lying when I said I'd missed your fire. Ever since our time together at the manor, I missed the Draco that challenged me, the one who never let me win without a fight. And maybe the wounded parts of you reminded me of my own. I think we all deserve to heal, and I thought we could figure out what that looks like together. He contemplated her words, wondering why Hermione drew him in. As a boy, he loved antagonizing her. He liked getting under her skin. Some of that was still true, but it felt different. When I was in Azkaban, I felt something in me snap. It wasn't immediate. It happened over time. One day, I felt like myself. I was angry and remorseful. I wanted out. I never believed I belonged there. But the longer I was there, the thought shifted. I realized I deserved the punishment, for however long it continued. Azkaban started to feel like the home I deserved. And when I accepted that, I began losing the bits and pieces that always made me me. And when you returned to the manor, I vowed I wouldn't be the same person I was at Hogwarts. I'd never give you another reason to fear me again. I don't know how to keep that promise and take back the pieces of me I lost. Something in her expression softened. Hermione tilted her head and stared at him. Despite what you think, I've never been afraid of you. Of the things you've done, sure, but of you... I don't want you to pack away all the pieces that you think are troublesome, Draco. I want you to accept them as parts of yourself, and see how they might fit into what we have here. He frowned. What do you mean? I like that you keep me on my toes, and I won't admit it to anyone else, but as someone with your heavy sense of pride, I've always admired your ego. Funny, he chuckled. You might be the only one. Hermione shrugged. This wasn't new. This isn't a fleeting idea I had when we returned to Hogwarts. I've always paid attention. I knew who was right behind me in class. I saw that there were layers of personality beyond what you would let others see. Perhaps, after all these years, I'm happy to have the opportunity to learn who the real Draco Malfoy is. He sighed, fixing his attention on the glass in hand. He tightened his grip. And what if you don't find you like him all that much? Isn't that what dating is? We spend time together. We figure out who we are together and when we're apart. What if you learn that you don't like me? He shook his head. I don't think that's possible, Granger. If you'll recall, I'm incredibly stubborn. I talk too much and I'm a terrible swat. She smirked. All endearing attributes, if you ask me. Her head fell back and she laughed. You might be the only one who thinks that. As the moment washed over them, it began to rain. It started as an echo across the lake, slowly approaching. Draco cursed. He pulled his robes higher over his head, but it appeared Hermione had a different idea. She stood with her arms outstretched. As the rain fell, it kissed her face and slid down her neck. Draco tugged her down beside him. Another well-cast charm had the boat coasting quickly toward the shore. Hermione was the first off the boat. She kicked off her shoes and ran ahead until her feet found soft grass. As Draco levitated the boat onto the rocks, Hermione started to laugh. The rain was pounding down on their heads. The sky had opened up. Draco watched as she spun in circles, catching raindrops on her cheeks and laughing almost maniacally. "'You're insane,' he said. "'We should head back to the castle.' "'No,' she told him. "'We'll wait it out here.' Hermione laid back in the wet grass, her arms and legs outstretched as she welcomed the downpour. You'll get sick carrying on like this, Draco huddled beside her. He lifted his robes over her head. It's nice, she mused before swatting him away. Watching Hermione, completely carefree, it prodded at something inside of him. With her damp curls plastered to her cheeks, her toes buried in the mud, and soaked through to her skin, she was breathtaking. Another piece of him slid into place. Draco laid back beside her outstretching his arms as she had done. He began to laugh. He felt ridiculous, but hearing Hermione's own laughter removed the self-conscious weight from his chest. He gave in to the rain, to the dampness of his clothes, and he realized he was still warm. Rolling onto his side, he caught Hermione by the neck. She turned his head as he dragged her closer. Draco kissed her with more reverence than he'd ever managed to before. He allowed his hands to wander her curves. He threw hesitancy aside and worshipped the feel of her skin, her bare arms and legs. Hermione moved to straddle him. 
she pulled her dress over her head, exposing the lacy set she wore beneath it. Draco's hands went to her waist. Her lips were on his again, and he relished in the vast map that was her. And long minutes later, after the rain had stopped, and when Draco was seated to the hilt inside of her, he remembered the sensation of bare feet in the grass, the scent of jasmine and citrus, and the feeling of home. It started as a whisper, one he didn't have to work to hear. Alone in his bed, the thought had come to him. It wasn't unusual to think of Hermione whilst in bed anymore, and it certainly wasn't unwelcome. But this situation was different. It was paired with the desperate realization that he had something to lose again, and that thought terrified him. He'd only just begun to notice small things about her, behaviors, idiosyncrasies to some, but mannerisms he was learning to adore. It stemmed from their conversation on the boat. Draco considered if there was anything about Hermione that might make him feel differently about her. But the more he thought about it, the more he learned he liked. Hermione pulled her hair back while she worked through a complex thought. Across the table from him, he saw her do it for the first time. The second took place a week later in the common room. Over the weeks, he watched her. He lost track of how often her brilliant brain demanded her full concentration, and she was never bothered by the loose curl or two that fell across her forehead. Occasionally, she'd feel they were there and idly brush them aside. They always returned to the exact same place, and she never noticed. Hermione chewed her lip when she was nervous, which Draco learned he made her quite frequently. When he finally struck up the nerve to kiss her in the great hall, she stared back at him with wide brown eyes. Her teeth cut into her bottom lip, and she watched him warily. "'If you're going to look so bloody snuggable, the least I can do is oblige.' "'Oh.' Her posture straightened, and Draco laughed. While they ate in silence, he'd catch her sneaking a glance at him. Every time, that bottom lip stayed planted between her teeth. The one time he held her stare, he grinned. Her own smile blossomed, and her lip yanked free from the hold. Hermione Granger had a temper. He'd been on the receiving end often enough to recognize the extent of it, but when he wasn't, that temper was mesmerizing. He watched her take down professors three times her age in the classroom. She flattened their classmates at round tables during study hours. He knew now by the melodic tap of her heels if she was off to something casual, or if someone at Hogwarts was moments away from being hexed. All of those mannerisms on their own were inconsequential. In fact, he guaranteed there were many witches who did the same things. But altogether, and coupled with the fact that this particular witch was Hermione Granger, they created the startling realization he was grappling with tonight. With all of it laid out in front of him, Draco Malfoy realized he was losing yet another home. "'You're awfully quiet this evening.' They were in her bed. That's where they spent the majority of their time when they weren't in class or studying. Her fingers drew idle patterns over his chest as he stroked her arm. "'Sickle for your thoughts?' she said. Draco sighed, burying his nose into her hair. He loved the smell of them on her. "'The term is almost over.' He wondered if she could hear it in his voice, the panic, the insecurity. He internally pleaded that she couldn't. "'One more week until our N.E.W.T.'s, and then the gala,' she added. He hummed. His hold on her tightened, but Hermione said nothing further. Draco believed he'd veiled his concerns well. Across the hall, his eyes met hers. She was walking up the aisle, having just completed the practical portion of her final N.E.W.T., Draco stood. Her hand slipped into his. How did it go? Hermione shrugged. I had an excellent potions tutor. Anything less than an outstanding would shock me. Draco chuckled. He swung an arm around her waist as he led her from the hall. They'd have to give your brightest witch title to someone else. Are oh, you up for the job? She ribbed him playfully. No. As it stands, I'm enjoying the scenery, following your lead. He pinched her arse and Hermione swatted him. "'I have a few contacts who are interested in Hogwarts' second brightest student, if you're interested. I hear one of them is taking on someone for a potions mastery.' He came to a stop. His head tilted, and he stared at her. "'You found someone willing to take me on?' Hermione smiled. "'You'd have to handle the interview on your own, but I've been told, rest assured, that prejudices will not play a factor in their consideration.' Draco's lips parted. His jaw wavered. 
He had Hermione in his arms and his mouth on hers right at the foot of the grand staircase. She was more stunning in that dress than Draco remembered. Her hair was pulled back. He had an unobstructed view of her long neck and jaw. He wanted to drag his teeth over them, but he'd behave. She was here as a guest of honor, and he was her respectable date. Draco met Hermione at her dorm. He extended an arm as he led her down to the great hall. Before they entered the stairwell, he pushed her into the stone and arched back to admire her openly. "'You'll have to watch me fight off other wizards tonight if they so much as look at you.' "'That'd be quite a feat, considering I have a speech to give.' He grumbled in irritation before pulling her away. "'I know I've said it, but thank you for coming with me.' "'For the view alone it was worth it,' he smirked. "'Not so terrible from where I'm standing either,' she remarked, and he didn't miss the way her eyes trailed over his chest. He chuckled, letting his lips linger against her head briefly before entering the hall. It was modestly decorated. Madame Sprout provided the greenery. McGonagall had transfigured the tables in their settings. They were celebrating Hogwarts, and so anything excessive would have taken away from the strength that had been restored. It was about the students and the staff and the found families they'd been fortunate to continue to create. Family. Home. Draco hadn't forgotten. He'd hid his fears well, focusing on their N.E.W.T.s and Hermione's upcoming speech. He put everything into his time spent alone with her, but he hadn't forgotten what this evening would be. An end. A robbery. Because when Hermione returned to her life tomorrow, she'd take all the restored pieces of Draco with her. They greeted the other guests, alumni, parents, ministry personnel. Everyone had come out in support of the school and its restoration. Draco didn't miss the tentative glances sent his way, nor did he miss the whispers. He held himself with grace at Hermione's side, never wandering more than a foot away from her. They could stare, they could talk, but it didn't change the fact that in this moment, Hermione was his. And when it was time to dance, he led her proudly to the dance floor. Draco held her tight, feeling pride for that one more day he could show the world he was hers. The thought had him clinging to her. His hand wrapped around Hermione's a little too tight. Draco's arm around her waist sought to cut off circulation from her legs. "'Come back to me,' she whispered. Her lips brushed his ear. Hermione's hand curled higher over his shoulder. She buried her head into his shirt, and he felt her chest expand as she took a deep breath. "'Lost in thought,' he murmured. "'I have Britain's most beautiful witch in my arms. Can you blame me?' "'Only Britain.' When she pulled back, he saw her pout. Every bloke here wishes they were me. His eyes circled the room, noting once more how very right he was. You can't see it, can you? she asked. He hummed in reply, trailing a hand down her back. The jealousy. They don't want to be you, Draco. They want what we have. He wanted it, too. Merlin did he ever. But they had needed to be guarded. He wanted to bottle it up, preserve it, and carry it with him everywhere he went. He was on the precipice of losing it all. They shouldn't be jealous. They should pity him for getting too involved. He voiced none of those insecurities, and instead buried his nose into her hair. And what have we found, Granger? He felt her smile against his chest. She squeezed his hand. Home. You're all packed up. He glanced around her dormitory. White walls had been stripped of her photos and books. The bed was bare. The sun had set, and its rays were but a distant memory. He felt his chest clench as he took it all in. The empty room. The loss of something. She didn't answer immediately. Standing at the center of her room, she studied him. Draco was hot beneath her scrutiny. "'It's time,' she told him. Draco frowned as he met her eyes. I've been letting you work through this for weeks now. I hoped you'd come to me, but it's time now, Draco. I can't leave not knowing what's on your mind. Drawing a hand over the back of his neck, Draco sighed. He sat at the edge of her bed, still holding her stare. This summer, it's... His words trailed off. He cleared his throat. I wasn't expecting it. I can't say I was either. Go on, she urged. Looking down at his hands, Draco drew them into fists. 
I was right when I said staying away from me was the best for both of us. We reached the end, and I... End? Hermione's feet stepped into view. He looked up at her. You're going to Australia. For two weeks. And to work for the minister following that. And I... He had nothing. There was no plan. There was only the girl. And you what, Draco? You can't make time for me. This was a summer romance and nothing more. Her evident anger confused him. He shook his head. No, that's not... I... I don't know where we stand. Hermione's jaw hardened as she lowered her eyes. You haven't asked me. I... He straightened. Neither have you. I thought we were on the same page, she argued back. Page, he laughed. I don't even know what bloody book we're reading. Tell me what you want from me, Hermione said. "'because I'm standing here in this dress with my bags packed "'and a pool key to Australia, "'and I thought I'd be coming back home to you. "'But if I was wrong, home.' "'His eyebrows skyrocketed. Hermione blushed. "'You said that earlier,' he continued prodding. "'I didn't mean a specific home. I meant—' "'She silenced. "'Draco took her hands in his. "'His eyes met her warm brown. "'I didn't want the time to end.' I don't want to go back to the manor. There's nothing there for me now. I realized weeks ago that wherever you are, that's home for me. That's where I started finding the pieces of me I lost. And the closer we got to the end, I was watching everything get stripped away from me again. I gave you too much power over me. You ruined everything. You ruined rain and starry nights and summer days. I just got them back. But I'll see you everywhere now. And I'm not sure there's a home for me without you in it. Draco. She smiled. It was small, but he felt it spark warmth in his chest. You love me. Aye. His eyes widened. He was frowning, and then softened, and then utterly perplexed. I think I might, Granger. She leaned down, with her forehead pressing into his. I think I might love you too, Malfoy. Malfoy.